Hi, these are the top 20 films of 1988. When I say top, I mean my personal favourite films. 1988 was a great year for cinema, so there's going to be loads I missed off, so please do include your favourite films down below. Anyway, let's get on with the list. Cheers. In at number 20, They Live. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble. John Carpenter's wildly entertaining sci-fi film about a drifter who finds a pair of sunglasses that reveal the true nature of the world. The highlight of the film is the six minute fight scene where Roddy Piper tries to get Keith David to wear the said pair of shades. Put on the glasses. In at number 19, Rain Man. Tom Cruise gives an Oscar-worthy performance in this road movie about two brothers. Dustin Hoffman is also in it. We're going to be here the entire morning with no with no maple syrup right. and, and, and no and no toothpicks. I'm definitely definitely not right. gonna not gonna have my my, my pancakes with with. Right. Uh, right. Ow! Don't make a scene. Ow! Stop acting like a fucking retard. Uh oh. And the Oscar goes to. In a number eighteen, big. This film about a kid who gets his wish to become an adult is really bizarre. A woman literally sleeps with a twelve-year-old boy, and that's just fine. Tom Hanks is brilliantly charming in the picture, but there is a big issue. He plays it like a seven-year-old. Twelve-year-olds do not behave this way. Great. But do I have to share my room? I mean, there's there's this invisible line, and, and uh, even if even if you're attracted to someone, are you gonna call someone before? No. This is a common problem in body swap movies. The very same year, Vice Versa had Judge Reinhold swap bodies with Fred Savage. And Reinhold plays the semi-serious Savage as a four-year-old. You don't have to take tests at work. I bet people don't push you around calling you shrimp and microbe. You know, I wish I could change places with you. Look, Mo. Downtown. It's a big city. And the Oscar goes to... In number 17, The Last Temptation of Christ. The master Martin Scorsese finally gets to make his movie about Jesus. Here with a very, very heavy New York cast. All my life I wanted to be a disciple. In number 16, Frantic. Criminal Roman Polanski makes this very entertaining Hitchcock-esque film about a doctor whose wife goes missing in Paris. There are some great funny details in it, but it's Ford that really makes this film what it is. You go now! Don't mess with me, man. I am an American and I am crazy. In a number 15, Salam Bombay. A vibrant and moving film about the life of a child on the streets of Bombay. It's visually arresting and completely transports you to India. In a number 14, Alice. Jan Svankmeyer directs my personal favourite adaptation of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. He used stop motion animation to create some truly horrible sequences. Great stuff. In a number 13, Hairspray, probably my favourite John Waters film, a film about a pleasantly plump schoolgirl who fights against racial segregation after becoming a dancer on a local Baltimore TV channel in the 1960s. Great comedy, dancing and one hell of a soundtrack. A one, two, a one, two, three, pony! Mashed potatoes? Faster! In a number 12, The Vanishing, the second film on this list about someone trying to find their partner who went missing. This Dutch film though is far, far darker, featuring one of the nastiest film endings of all time. In a number 11, My Neighbour Totoro, 
one of Miyazaki's very best films. A charming tale of two girls who make friends with wood spirits in the countryside. It's imaginative, beautiful and incredibly moving. Personally, for me, 1988 was the very best year for anime. Before we get to the top 10, here are some other notable releases of 1988. It was a great year for top-notch performances. The sexiest people on earth, John Malkovich and Glenn Close, played moralist seducers brilliantly in Dangerous Liaisons. Jeremy Irons gave one of the best portrayals of twins in David Cronenberg's twisted Dead Ringers. Juliet Binoche was outstanding in the unbearable lightness of being. Alan Parker's Mississippi Burning expertly brought 1960s racial tension to the screen, with star turns from Willem Dafoe and Gene Hackman. And before Tom Cruise was hanging off tall objects, he was putting his dedication into flipping bottles in cocktail. And his wingman, Val Kilmer, gave a scene-stealing performance in Willow. Don't! There's a, a pack here with an acorn pointed at me! I wouldn't want to waste it. Ha! It was a top year for horror. The murderous doll Chucky made his debut in Child's Play. The remake of The Blob had some of the most inventive deaths of the year. As did the revolting Hellraiser 2. Time to play. Hellbound. Hellraiser 2. And there was the wonderful piece of nonsense that is killer clowns from outer space. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Knock my block off? <laughs> it was a very good year for comedy. The British film A Fish Called Wanda featured an Oscar winning turn from Kevin Kline. I'm uh, Harvey Manfred Jensen. I really like Scrooged, a quite nasty modern adaptation of A Christmas Carol. I can't get the antlers glued onto this little guy. We've tried crazy glue, but it don't work. Have you tried staples? Eddie Murphy came to America. I have recently been placed in charge of garbage. Do you have any that requires disposal? Michael Caine and Steve Martin had great chemistry in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Now tell me, do you feel this? No. How about that? Nothing. How about this? Nothing. Oh, I will have him running, jumping, shouting, screaming. Oh, my name isn't Dr. Emil Schaffhausen. So say it. <laughs> Look, doctor, he's so happy, he's crying. Mm. Heathers featured plenty of dark comedy. My son's a homosexual. And I love him. I love my dead gay son. And moving away from action, Arnold Schwarzenegger played Danny DeVito's twin in Twins. You get the joke? I mean, you know, just look at them. Twins. The twins. That's right. Speaking of action, Jean-Claude Van Damme had his first starring role in Bloodsport as did wanker Steven Seagal in Above the Law. Hey, fuck your mood, man. What's happening, brother? Yo, what'd it be like, homie? No. Carl Weathers starred in the hilarious Action Jackson. And all action. How do you like your ribs? And for action sequels, we had Rambo 3 and Police Story 2, which featured some of the very best fight scenes of the year. There was also a fair number of turkeys in the form of E.T. ripoff, Mac and Me. And my very least favourite film of the year was Vibes, where Cindy Lauper and Jeff Goldblum play a pair of psychics wandering around South America with Peter Falk. Utter shite. It's, it's Norway. Oh, crack you up. <laughs> words. I love the way you talk. You probably also say penis. Right, let's get back to the top 10. In at number 10, Cinema Paradiso. This nostalgic coming of age drama is utterly beautiful. A film director hears someone from his old village in Sicily has died. That night he lies awake remembering his past. 
The recently deceased man was the man who worked in the projector room at the local cinema. Their relationship is sweet and heartbreaking. Salvatorio Casquillo gives one of the best child performances, and Philip Noré is perfect as the man who has a special bond with him. It's a film that looks back at the relationships that have formed you, but also the movies that have. It rejoices in the wonder of film. The cinema is his church. The joy of cinema, the collective experience, the big screen, the smiles and the tears of the audience. Sometimes the film is a little too sickly sweet, or possibly even a little naive in how it shows an audience watching these films. But much like the Italian neo-realist films of the 40s and the 50s, it may be sugary sweet, but at any moment it can be heart-wrenching. Helping all this along is Ennio Morricone's stunning score. Cinema Paradiso is a love letter to the power of cinema. In a number nine, Akira, another five-star anime from 1988. Much like Blade Runner six years before it, this takes place in a dystopian 2019. And much like that film, it set the way for all cyberpunk that was to follow. The plot is marvelously mental. A head of a biker club has to deal with his friend after he acquires telekinetic powers, which get more and more out of control, threatening Neo Tokyo as a whole. The animation has almost never been bettered. There is a kinetic energy to the whole picture that is hypnotic. Along with this is a unique score blending traditional Japanese and Indonesian music. It's totally unique. It's a mind-bending picture that sweeps you up, shakes you around, and leaves you wiped by the end of it. In number eight, the Thin Blue Line. No, not the 90s British sitcom. Give me one good reason not to jump! All right, I will. That is a public pavement down there. <laughs> but one of the best and most inventive documentaries of the 1980s. It deals with the trial and conviction of a man wrongly accused of killing a Texas policeman. The interviews are fascinating, but what sets this film apart is its use of cinematic reenactments using beautiful, colourful imagery and a spellbinding score by Philip Glass. In modern times, reenactments seem tacky, exploitative and unnecessary, but here they are used, certainly to manipulate, but to get us to care and be invested because there is literally a man's life on the line. The film is deeply political and succeeded in some of its aims. Randall Adams was released from prison one year later, and this showed the power that documentaries can have. In a number seven, the Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Unfairly most known for being a massive box office bomb. This Terry Gilliam film about the untrustworthy narrator adventurer Baron Munchausen is as imaginative as cinema gets. Maybe it failed to make any money due to its odd title. I'm Baron Munchausen. Mm, that sounds nasty. Is it contagious? Or that it had an old man as a hero. Or maybe just because it's bonkers and has a bizarre and confusing ending. What this does, though, is take you on one hell of an adventure. Gilliam does dreamlike movies better than anyone. Dreams are chaotic and rarely make sense. Here we go from the moon to the belly of a giant fish, and you never question any of it. The sets, the effects, and the costumes are all sumptuous. The master composer Michael Kamen delivers one of his very best scores, romantic and rousing, and the cast is astonishing. John Neville is perfectly charming in the lead. You got Eric Idle, you abandoned me here, you swine. You toddled off with that old queen of tarts and left me to rot in that parrot cage, didn't you? And now you come back here just because it suits you after wasting half my life and expect me to follow you to the ends of the earth. Yes. Oh, all right. Oliver Reed. You small-minded, petty bush rock. Get up, you shut up. And a wonderfully mad performance from Robin Williams as the King of the Moon. Here you go, lovebirds. I'm sure you'll be very uncomfortable. <laughs> Is this a perfect film? No, it's a mess. But what a marvelously mesmerizing mess it is. In a number five, Midnight Run. One of the best buddy cop films of the 80s. Although neither buddy is really a buddy or a cop. But this rib achingly fun action comedy still falls into that genre. Robert De Niro plays a bounty hunter, given the seemingly simple task of transporting a white collar criminal played by Charles Grodin from New York to LA. 
What begins as a quick midnight run turns into an epic road movie where they are pursued by rival bounty hunters, the FBI and the Mafia. De Niro plays it straight perfectly and Grodin gives his very best performance as the difficult, lying and anxious criminal trying to do what's best. The comedy is top notch, as is the supporting cast including Yafet Koto, Dennis Farina, Joe Pantaleano and Philip Baker Hall. But the heart of this film is the relationship between De Niro and Grodin. They couldn't have played it better. The film also features Danny Elfman's most different score. Midnight Run is tremendous fun. In at number five, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. It's showtime. A film with a far more standard Danny Elfman score. Tim Burton's second feature film is the first to really feel like a true Burton movie. In its style, its themes and in its dark humour. Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin play a brilliantly bland couple who die soon after moving into their new home. They enter the afterlife and have to deal with all the bureaucracy and paperwork that comes with it. When an annoying family moves into their home that they are destined to haunt, they decide to scare them out of it. Struggling to do this, they hire the devious professional haunter, Beetlejuice, played superbly by Michael Keaton. What do you think of this? <laughs> you like it? Excuse us, please. They were warned not to take his help, and soon they wish they had followed that advice as the situation gets more and more out of control. Burton is having a ball with the sets, costumes and effects. It all fits perfectly into his grim fantasy wheelhouse. Catherine O'Hara, Jeffrey Jones and Winona Ryder are delightful as the family that moves in. But the two people who steal the show are Burton and Keaton. The former with his immediate style and flair for creative visuals and the latter for his boundless energy as the revolting spectre. Hey! Sorry, didn't see you sitting there. Women. In a number four, The Naked Gun from the files of Police Squad, one of the funniest films of all time. Wilma, I promise you, whatever scum did this, not one man on this force will rest for one minute until he's behind bars. Now let's grab a bite to eat. Yeah, come on, Wilma. David Zucker brings back Leslie Nielsen as Lieutenant Frank Drebin from the television comedy Police Squad. Nielsen's straight performance as the useless policeman is one of the great comedy performances. Come on, let go of that fellow. <laughs> The story about an assassination attempt on the Queen at a baseball game is fun nonsense, but what matters here are the jokes, and they almost all land, and land at a frequent rate. You didn't do anything, huh? I've got rights, look, I... Look here. He's got a picture of your wife. Ethel. <laughs> all right. Anyone else here seeing his wife? That's all right. That's okay, Frank. A minute doesn't go past without a belly laugh. They can't kick you off the force, Frank. It's just not fair. I know, Ed. Life isn't always fair. Just think the next time I shoot someone, I could be arrested. This is silly comedy at its best. You're laughing so hard, you're able to look past the fact that O.J. Simpson is in it. Nielsen would go on to be hilarious in the two sequels, but this first one is by far the best. Not gonna be easy. Everywhere I look, something reminds me of her. In a number three, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Who would have thought that one of the greatest kids' films of all time would be a noir starring Bob Hoskins as a private detective trying to find out if a rabbit murdered a man? Robert Zemeckis had already directed the marvellous Romancing the Stone and Back to the Future, but here I think he outdoes himself with this wonderfully creative mystery live action comedy animated romance. The world created is one where people live alongside cartoons. It shouldn't work, but does, because you totally believe in these characters, whether made of flesh and bone or ink and paper. It's a full-on family film with great silly cartoon jokes and sequences and a 1940s set film noir full of murder, deceit, and sex. Well, patty cake. Patty cake? This is impossible. I don't believe it. It can't be. It just can't be. That's against my wife. It's absolutely impossible. Bob
Bob Hoskins accent isn't spot on but he still gives a tremendous performance as the alcoholic detective who hates cartoons because Toon killed his brother what? Huh? dropped the piano on his head Christopher Lloyd is having a ball as the villainous Judge Doom and providing stellar voice work is Charles Fleischer as Roger the out of control rabbit and Kathleen Turner whose sultry voice melds perfectly with the over the top seductively drawn Jessica Rabbit Zemeckis' direction is outstanding. One early shot of Hoskins tells you everything you need to know about his character and his history. It's absolutely outstanding. You never once doubt that these people are sharing the same space. It's an astonishing achievement. A very adult, silly kids film that's a real joy to watch again and again. In a number two, Die Hard. Without a doubt, one of the best action films of all time. The simple story of a New York cop fighting German criminals in a skyscraper has no right to be this good. It's the perfect example of the wonderful collaborative nature of feature films. John McTiernan was one hell of a director and this is the second in his brilliant run of Hollywood movies. He brought together one hell of a team. Cinematographer Jan de Bont, who would go on to direct the Die Hard on a bus blockbuster speed, shoots this film with style and gloss and a hell of a lot of lens flare which even has its own musical cue. Speaking of music, Michael Kamen's score is outstanding. He was one of the great film composers and doesn't get nearly enough love. The cast is exceptional. Bruce Willis is amazingly charming as arsehole John McClane. Yippee -ki, motherfucker. A pain in the ass for thieves pretending to be terrorists all around the world. And every great hero needs a great nemesis. And the late Alan Rickman delivers one of the very best villainous performances in film history. Rickman plays Hans Gruber, a very British German, and he really knows how to deliver some lines. Now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. The whole supporting cast is brilliant. From Hart Bochner as the detestable Ellis. Hans. Bobby, I'm your white knight. To Paul Gleason as the useless LAPD deputy chief. Sir, I, yeah, sir, the FBI is here. Oh, the FBI is here now? Yes, sir, right over there. Oops. Want a breath, man? Rounding off the cast is Reginald Vell Johnson as the lovable cop Owl. If I do have one criticism of the film, it's the side story where he learns to kill again. McTiernan keeps you on the edge of your seat throughout, and the action is top-notch. It builds and builds to huge moments, but also it works in its smaller ones. The sequels later try to get bigger and bigger, often forgetting how involving minor action can be, if well done. And here, it's done expertly. I like the next two Die Hard films, but none of them could match the original. Welcome to the party, pal! And in a number one, Grave of the Flyerflies. One of the greatest animated movies, one of the greatest war movies, and my favorite movie to show a brother and sister relationship. This is simultaneously mesmerizingly beautiful and impossible to watch. I can't think of this film without becoming quite overwhelmed with emotion. Very few war films completely get across the devastation that is caused by such conflicts. Even some of the greatest ever made have scenes that get you excited or get the adrenaline pumping. This is just about the horrors caused. Isao Takahata wrote and directed this story of a young boy and his little sister struggling to survive towards the end of the Second World War. It begins with the firebombing of Kobe, one of the most effective scenes of showing just how horrid the bombing of civilian cities is. Their mother dies in brutal fashion, but Sata hides it from his sister. The rest of the film has the boy desperately trying to look after her. From the opening we know it's not going to end well, which makes the film incredibly hard to watch, for even in their fleeting moments of happiness, it's a hopeless situation. The animation is astonishing, and the details of how the young children behave is immediately arresting and relatable. Their relationship is totally believable, and you completely forget that you're watching animation as you're swept up in their tragic tale. It's an anti-war film and gets that message across better than almost any war film prior or since. Takahata said it wasn't intended to be, but it is nevertheless. 
My lord, is it depressing. But when a film makes you feel as much as this one does, you can't help but love it. I've only seen it twice, and I'm not sure I can watch it again, but the power of it will always live with me. Right, so counting down my top 20. In a number 20, They Live. In a number 19, Rain Man. In a number 18, Big. In a number 17, The Last Temptation of Christ. In a number 16, Frantic. In a number 15, Salam Bombay. In a number 14, Alice. In a number 13, Hairspray. In a number 12, The Vanishing. In a number 11, My Neighbor Totoro. In a number 10, Cinema Paradiso. In a number 9, Akira. In a number 8, The Thin Blue Line. In a number 7, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. In a number 6, Midnight Run. In a number 5, Beetlejuice. In a number 4, Naked Gun. In a number 3, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. In a number 2, Die Hard. And in a number 1, Grave of the Fireflies. Well, those were my top 20 films of 1988. There's probably loads I've missed off. So what are your favourite films of 1988? Cheers.